Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Classic Gaming Brothers. I'm Seth. And I'm Zach. And we are the Classic Gaming Brothers. We are the Classic Gaming Brothers. That's right. I'm I'm very excited about this episode because we a the next episode we have a very exciting guest that we're gonna have on yeah we do and this episode is gonna be about some really exciting material oh so i'm so excited i'm excited to get to that riveting material so we're not gonna joke around today no 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 we're gonna talk about what you now me what have i been recently yeah what have you recently been playing seth i want to know so recently i've been playing a game called mark of the ninja remastered which was developed and published by uh klee entertainment klee k-l-e-i entertainment they're the same studio that did don't starve and oxygen not included so pretty i i would say pretty trendy games or trendy at one point in time games so they initially released mark of the ninja in 2012 And a remastered version was uh, released just in 2018, which I'm saying that now it's almost four years ago. Yeah. In Mark of the Ninja, you play as a ninja and you have to be ninja-y to get through the levels. So, which means you have the ability to sneak and you can disappear into the darkness. Uh, You get a grappling hook and little darts that can break lights and a sword to kill people with. The game relies on like darkness light mechanics. You can't be seen by flashlights or lanterns. So like Uh if you make a disturbance, they'll like run out and look for you and stuff like that. You can go through the levels without killing people and you get more points for doing so. But as I spoke in the last episode about how I play Deus Ex, usually trying to do that makes me angry. So I'm just killing people in this game. Though as a point of order, I did successfully beat Dishonored without ever being seen or killing anybody. So did did I even beat it with those two achievements? Because nobody saw me and nobody died. So did anything Ooh, happen? Good question. <laughs> Was I even there? Anyway, it's not me talking about Dishonored. Mark of the Ninja is a side-strolling 2D action platformer that moves really fluid, and it just feels like you are actually controlling a ninja. And it's been just a lot of fun. I enjoy, there's like these uh, go through, the the background's really cool. So it's like a traditional 2D side-scroller, but you can interact with the background. So uh-huh. you may see, not, but not all the background. But there may be like a statue or like a gong and you can hit it and you can like hit the gong and like people will come out and look for you and the statue you can like hide in the in the foreground or the background you can get behind it and the guards will walk in front of you which is kind of cool and the game is done up in a, a two different color palettes there's like a in the dark color palette and when there's light going on color palette and it's kind of cool sneaking through it it, it also had that like kind of like that vibe where you're playing like like you may be playing a stealth game, but you're the like scary creature, not the hiding person. Like you're not hiding from these people. You're like stalking these people. Kind of like what we talked about Batman and stuff like that. Or I was going to also say kind of like um... Carrion. Similar to Carrion. Not as gory, but similar type of like uh, hiding, going through uh vents and stuff like that type of yeah. situation so zach yes sir. what have you been playing recently well seth recently i've been playing duke nukem megaton edition so duke nukem 3d originally came out in 1996 and was developed by 3d realms megaton edition was developed by general arcade and published by our best friends over at devolver digital it was released on steam in march of 2013 Megaton Edition includes Duke Nukem 3D, Atomic Edition, which was a later release, uh, later as in like later in the 90s release of Duke Nukem 3D. Atomic Edition was like the Windows version where the original Duke Nukem 3D came out for MS-DOS, but it also includes Duke It Out in DC, which is a expansion pack where you have maps based on Washington, DC, and Duke Caribbean, Life's a Beach, where all of your weapons are replaced with squirt guns. And Duke Nuclear Winter, which is like winter themed. The game runs on OpenGL as well as having an original MS-DOS version of Duke Nukem inside of it so that it will launch in DOSBox. Um, And it's really a cool, cool game to play because it's a classic Duke Nukem game. It is the classic Duke Nukem 3D game that's been updated for modern engines. 
However, you cannot get Megaton Edition anymore. So in uh, 2016, or around 2016, a lot of the digital distribution rights for Duke Nukem 3D kind of fell into a weird legal limbo for a bit. And then Gearbox Software picked them up and Gearbox Software ended up releasing the 20th Anniversary World Tour which is different from Megaton Edition in that it doesn't include almost all, any of the DLC and stuff that was included in, or not DLC, but expansion packs that were included in Megaton. It's less content, but yeah, it's just, it's just less content. Now, funny story about Megaton Edition. I ended up getting it around the time it was, I think, first available on Steam because my friend thought for some reason that it was Duke Nukem Forever and was trying to buy me a joke gift. He inadvertently bought you an actual birthday gift. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. So it's 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 a fun game. Uh, again, it's unfortunate that you can't get the Megaton edition anymore, but I think 20th Anniversary World Tour isn't as bad as like, it doesn't have Duke It Out in DC and it doesn't have Life's a Beach or Nuclear Winter, I'm fairly certain does have a new mission at the very end that was built by the original people who worked on duke nukem though so that's pretty cool now this is a good episode oh, this because is such a good episode we're gonna talk about something that you will only hear here or on youtube or maybe some other podcasts but maybe specifically here maybe your only chance to hear about it i can't think of any other podcast that's going to talk about encarta mind maze than classic gaming brothers that's right I, I will definitely give it our go here. Good old Encarta Mind Maze. But you just, you just, you just, that, that was the... Did I spoil it? Is it the title of the episode, Encarta Mind Maze? No, 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 it's fine, no, it's fine, 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 it's fine. Uh, okay, okay. Fine, 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 so, fine. the thing about this episode is it really started off as a joke. Um, Seth and I were kind of chatting with each other a, a while before we actually sat down and recorded this, and we were just throwing out ideas, and Seth made a joke being like, oh, we should do an episode on this game, and he sent me a screenshot of Encarta Mind Maze, and he was like, let's do this. It's Encarta Mind Maze from 1995. And I was like, all right, write the notes. And he did. <laughs> I did. He did. And for those who are listening at home, I, I don't write the notes very frequently. But when I do, they're always the best. And now here we are. We are going to tread into this weird and fascinating world of 1995 multimedia products. <laughs> and the beauty <laughs> that is Encarta Mind Maze. So uh, I guess first we should talk about Encarta. If you weren't a 90s kid, you probably have no idea what Encarta is. I feel like Encarta is quintessential 90s content. Mm. Well, it was what you did. You, it's what you used before Wikipedia. Exactly. So like, I remember we had an Encarta CD lying around the house. Right. And you used it after using physical mediums, like yeah. physical books. I mean, I guess it is also a physical medium since it was about a CD-ROM. But you used Encarta. I feel like you used Encarta between using Encyclopedia Britannica books and using Wikipedia. Yeah. Don't we also have Encyclopedia Britannica books? We did. We did have the Encyclopedia Britannica or or like a cheap knockoff. D Dad will send in the correction. I guess before we get into Mind Maze, we should talk about what Encarta is. Encarta was developed and published by Microsoft, which apparently Seth was surprised by. I'm pretty sure I wasn't because I remember it being called Microsoft Encarta. Yeah, so here's my, here's where my surprise is. Allow me to explain myself. I remember the, the Encarta CD and I remember it saying Microsoft Encarta and it had the Windows logo on it. I, I think what my mind was that I thought that it was I thought Encarta was something else that was packaged by Microsoft because it came oh, with the computer. I so I thought it was like, you know, like brought to you by Microsoft. Like if you go to like a CVS or like a stop and shop, they're not the inventors of like nuts or scissors, but you can still buy CVS branded scissors. So like at the end of the day, like I, I that's why I kind of just kind of built up in my head that this Microsoft found this Encarta product and decided to brand it Microsoft Encarta. Well, to be honest, that's kind of what they did. So why did Microsoft decide that Encarta was such a good idea? Well, Compton's Encyclopedia, which was owned and published by the Encyclopedia Britannica, had a pretty successful release of Compton's Multimedia Encyclopedia. <laughs> That's a great... <laughs> I love that. In uh, 1989, in Grolier, who uh, has had their headquarters in Danbury, Connecticut, um, a, a great city that has a history of haberdasheries and has a um, garbage plant named after John Oliver. But uh, Grolier is now actually owned by Scholastic, which is, is also fun. But Grolier released what was called the New Grolier Multimedia Encyclopedia 
Encyclopedia, which they, they really love these rhyming names, in 1992. I think what they, they kind of like had to, right? Because multimedia was like something that you had to, in the early 90s, you had to put on like CD-ROMs. When it was software, it was like implying that you could use it for like, I don't know, multiple medias could use it. I think because I think some of those CD-ROMs you could like put in CD players and play music too. I just think it's funny that they're multimedia encyclopedias. Encyclopedias, yeah. yeah it's, a very, it is. it's a fun name. Uh, so Microsoft didn't want to be left behind with these two companies already putting out multimedia encyclopedias. So Microsoft went off and bought the rights, non-exclusive, to Funk and Wagnall's encyclopedia and electronically published the information in an original release they entitled Encarta in 1993. Over time, Microsoft acquired Collier's encyclopedia and New Merit Scholar's encyclopedia and folded their information into Encarta. For a sad fact, the incorporating of these encyclopedias into Encarta ultimately led to the print demise of these encyclopedias. Yeah, very sad fact. Collier's, New Merit, and Funk and Wagnalls stopped producing books because they were in Encarta. Now, Encarta is a fun name. It is also not a multimedia encyclopedia. It's just it's just straight up Encarta. It, where did that name come from? Why? An advertising agency. So an ad agency went to Microsoft and was like, you know what would be a good name for this? Encarta. And Microsoft was like, yeah, sounds good. The internal code name for Encarta at Microsoft was Gandalf, which I really just wished that they released an encyclopedia called Gandalf to the market so then people could be really confused especially if they put like a wizard on the cover and they were just like yes this is Gandalf and people are like ah excellent a game and then they brought it home and it was just an encyclopedia it was so good and then they could put it in the PC sections uh Encarta launched in 1993 and was priced at the opening price point of $395, which would be about $736 in 2021 dollars, which I think they were going for a comp to buying an encyclopedia. Because mm-hmm. I think what they were saying was you can get an entire encyclopedia on this disc and you should pay encyclopedia prices for it. Because encyclopedias in the 90s and or like even as, as encyclopedias came out, they were expensive because they were a lot of books. Like usually, I think like what, 24 to 26 books? Because usually had one for every single letter of the alphabet, maybe double if the, you know, if there was a lot going on in that letter, I guess. Yeah. But it, it's about 24 to 26 books you would get. Or they'd lump in a more, more case point. Like X, Y, and Z would all be one book. Regardless, uh, the consumers did not really see that they were going to be paying for that three ninety five price point, and Microsoft quickly lowered the price to ninety nine dollars or one hundred eighty four dollars in today's money. Eventually, uh, Microsoft would bundle Encarta into the price of a new computer, so you would buy a new computer that would come with Windows, and some of the Windows software would include Encarta of whatever year you bought that Windows, because they refreshed Encarta every year which is how we got our copy of Encarta it came with our Packard Bell which was a 486 and it came with Windows 3.11 and Encarta 95 which is fun because eventually Windows 95 came out but we didn't have Windows 95 we had Windows 3.11 but we had Encarta 95 regardless it also came with some other fun games like Spider-Man Cartoon Maker and Toon Land which we talked about in episode zero so if you want to hear us talk about Toon Land we don't talk about Toon Land the entire episode but we certainly do do mention it once. In my opinion, bundling Encarta 95 along with the other software, especially with Encarta 95 being av- well, the version of Encarta being available for ninety nine dollars, really like a value add. You're getting like a hundred dollars worth of software. It's like it's like getting like a cheap version of Adobe or something with your computer purchase, which companies do today. They usually throw in a game or two if you buy a certain amount of parts or type type of system, or maybe some production software if you're not buying a computer from a computer gaming store and you buy it from like a regular do people even buy desktop computers for like function my fiance uses a computer for function but she doesn't use a desktop she just uses a surface (laughs) like do, do do like that's a question not for our listeners because they're all video gamers so they, yeah, they won't yeah. know but regardless now Encarta would go on to live a long life before eventually being discontinued in 2009 there was a physical release from 93 to 2008 
that's when you could get the CD-ROM. At some point in time, Encarta was migrated to the internet and they kind of discontinued the physical medium. And then eventually they discontinued the entire product in 2009. They had a online dictionary available, which they discontinued in 2011. As we mentioned earlier, there was a game buried on it, which is why we're talking about it on a, on a video game podcast because yeah. we want to we want to dig through all of the I don't, don't want to say the trash and Carta was a, a useful service at the time, but like di- we're just digging through the the rubble as it were to find find these video games buried away. So Encarta did come with a game that was mind maze Encarta also usually had a version of a tool uh, that simulated orbits which was not really a game it was more of a a teaching aid but it was kind of funny to play with because you can like make hilariously obnoxious orbits so if you wanted to have fun besides mind maze you had the orbits mind maze was in almost every physical version of Encarta, though we can't confirm if it was in 93 or 2008 and every edition was pretty much the same though there was a graphical update from 1994 to 1995 seth and i owned Encarta 95 and that's where most of our memories really lie with that edition so if you owned like Encarta 2000 and had a different memory of mind maze that's great and sorry this is not what we're going to talk about so mind maze was set in a medieval castle it was a point and click trivia puzzler the user could decide to answer questions in one particular subject or all the subjects per question so here are some of the subjects life science geography history physical science social science religion and philosophy art language and literature performing arts sports hobbies and pets i like that pets is just like lumped in with the sports and hobbies it's like these are leisurely activities i'm kind of curious what like trivia questions are about pets like is it about famous pets i think it's just about like it's an encyclopedia so you can ask about like dogs but wouldn't that just be bundled under life science because that's an animal anyway there are also four difficulty levels uh which was funny because the easier questions were predominantly questions regarding the United States of America. <laughs> so if you did not live in the United States of America and had a copy of Encarta... Which you might have because they they translated and localized it to multiple different countries. Then the easy version might not have been so easy for you because it was questions about the history of the United States of America, which also might have been difficult for people who just don't know a lot about our history, which is a surprising number of American citizens. The difficulty levels could be adjusted per question and we're called, wait for it, difficulty one, difficulty two, difficulty three, and the last one is difficulty four. I, I like that, that you could like kind of just ad hoc change your experience while playing in Carta by changing the difficulty and also the questions that you're going to receive. Another thing that I, I really enjoyed about in Carta was in the game, you're exploring this castle in first person perspective and you're clicking through and there's like artwork hanging on the wall in the background and you can click on that artwork and it would bring you to a corresponding Encarta article about said artwork. So if you're like, ah, oh, that artwork is interesting, you could click it and you can read an article all about the artwork. And it, and it could have been an artwork that would represent an idea. So it could have been like a, a picture of perhaps like religious symbology and it brings you to a page about the religion or it could just be artwork and you can learn about the art. Now, there was an actual story to Mind Maze, which is impressive that there was actually a story. And that story was that there was a curse that befell this medieval castle. And personally, I feel like the curse was that it made it filled with the creepiest people ever because there are people in the castle as you walk through it now mind you this this game is delivered in like a a photo type of adventure game so it's uh like frames so you go into one room and it's a frame you click a door you enter into another frame there's no like moving around i mean it's a game built in encyclopedia so like i i the, we're we're hoping for like if you're thinking that there's going to be animation in here in a in an encyclopedia game in the 90s you would be wrong but there were these people in the in the castle that were in various states of doing things and a there was usually like one person per room and b they were usually doing something weird <laughs> there was like first of all a creepy jester who usually would hang from the ceiling and you would just stare into his eyes and just 
just be like, this guy is really weird. To the point where I was reading some people talking about their experiences playing the game, and they talked about how they thought the objective of the game was to run away from the jester, and that he would occasionally crop up again, and he would continue to chase you. And he would also go into different stages. There was like a jack-in-the-box, and sometimes the jester sat on the jack-in-the-box, sometimes he was upside down on the wall. It was, it was, it was weird. Uh, there was also other people. There was like a merchant who could have been also an assassin because he looked very like an assassin uh there was a jovial king henry but he wasn't the king he was just like a jovial lord there was a guy in the stockade in a room so there'd be like you just go in a room and there'd be a guy in like um like the arm stockade so he would just have his head in the arms through the stockade this may just be me exaggerating a little bit but it, honestly google it look through those pictures of Encarta. they're definitely creepy now your objective was to reverse this curse which in my hope was to make those people less creepy perhaps they were trapped there as a curse frozen in time complaining about their woes so like you were prompted to ask, answer questions at the bottom of the screen but you could also click on the people and they would tell you little stories about themselves. It was interesting, to say the least. I feel like it's Beauty and the Beast, except of turning people into objects, they were turned into creepy people. <laughs> now, every floor in this castle was, as you might suspect, a maze. A mind maze? No, just a regular old maze. Oh, that's kind of lame. Unless, of course, the whole thing of this being a mind maze is that your player is actually just tripping and is like really just oh, Or your gone. player's in hell. No, maybe just tripping because it's a, like their mind, right? They're experiencing this no, mind maze. No, but I maze. mean, maybe he's like, maybe hell is just being trapped in your mind. Oh, perhaps. Regardless, every level was a maze. And at the end of each of these mazes was a set of stairs which would continue to lead you upwards and upwards in a never-ending quest to nowhere. Well, actually, it was in a quest to get points because you needed points to win. The player was equipped with five torches that would light up the entire maze, which allowed the player to understand how the maze of the current floor was laid out for a moment. The player controlled the action by using their mouse and clicking on various doors, and depending on where the door was located, it would send them to the corresponding location on the map. When the player goes through a door, they are prompted with a question. The question would either be in a chosen subject, or it would be a random question. Yeah, if you selected all the subjects. And each question had four options to choose from, and the player got two chances to choose correctly. So, in essence, you could probably guess your way through the entirety of the game. Since I don't believe there was either a penalty for losing outright, yeah, either you just, I don't think you were awarded the points, but you weren't, like, ejected from the castle or murdered, which would be an interesting twist if this was a game by Microsoft. Now, every time you started to answer a question, there would be, like, a clock, and you would get less points per question question making your desire to answer these questions quickly so making it stressful uh the longer you took to answer the question the less points you'd get ultimately you were attempting to reach twenty thousand points and once you reach that point total the endless staircase stopped and it, instead the next set of stairs that you took led up into the king's chamber i'm gonna be honest here i have never beaten in carta probably because you didn't get a lot of points per question you got like a hundred and you lost points from there so you're talking about 50 to 60 points and you need to get to 20,000. That's a lot of trivia. And this game, as exciting as the soundtrack was, did not hold my attention as a child for that long. Thus, I never beat Encarta personally. However, I did read a little bit about, and I did watch a little bit about. So, what I read was that in the end, you would be led up the stairs into the king's chamber, and the king would invite you, the player, to rule over the kingdom after he dies, which I think is just weird. Also, in that explanation, it doesn't explain that you actually defeated the curse, and I'm just wondering if you're just gonna rule this creepy castle of people, and you're actually just still stuck there in hell. It's like a Willy Wonka? Yeah, kind of. However, I did watch an Encarta 97 playthrough, not the entire thing, I'm, I'm not that crazy, but I watched the end, and the player got up to the end, and they entered a room where the king and queen were up there with a number of other guests, I guess hidden away in like the secret place 
that they could just party without the rest of the castle being trapped somewhere. And they greet you as a hero for freeing them from this curse. And they invite the player to stay for a banquet in the player's honor, which is oh. nice. And you, then you were you were allowed to leave the castle. But if you wanted to return, the king would teach you his magical ways. But that was the end. And then in car- then you got your name up on the high score list at the beginning of the castle, and you could go through the bind maze all over again fun so i i did dig through and find some questions from encarta in case you were wondering what type of questions they would ask you as possible trivia one of the questions was and this was the easy one as in difficulty one science dealing with the fundamental constitutes of the universe the forces they exert on one another and the results produced by these forces is sociobiology physics geology or chemistry huh physics that is correct now, here's a harder question. This is the hardest question, not the the hardest question in the game. So this is an example of a difficulty four question. Chinese gambling game, as well as a Western card game. Is it Fan Tan, Pinochle, Hearts, or Mahjong? Well, I know that Mahjong is a Chinese gambling game. However, I'm also aware that Fan Tan is a name used for the game Sevens, which is a Western card game, and that Fantan is also a Chinese gambling game. So, Seth, I'm going to go with Fantan. All right. I would say you're correct. (laughs) Pinochle was brought over by uh, uh, Germans. Oh. And that's going to be the end of our Incarta Mind Maze episode, where we talk about a mind in your maze. Before we leave Mind Maze... The music is a wonderful MIDI score that is amazing. And Zach will have at the beginning of this episode. And it is glorious. I love it so much. So anyway, that's going to bring us to the end of our Encarta episode. Hope you enjoyed this weird jaunt down history, I guess. And learned a little bit about Mind Maze. So we're going to get to our Buy, Wait, Pass segment. So I'm excited about Buy, Waiting, or Passing on a game called Moon's of Darcelon, which is being developed by Dr. Kucho with an exclamation point <laughs> and is set to be released in December of 2021. The game is a retro stylized, meaning 8-bit type graphics, 8-bit music, 8-bit speech, and even comes with a filter to make it appear that you're playing it on a CRT. It is a action 2D platformer, though very different compared to the other 2D platformer, the action 2D platform that I was talking about, Mark and Ninja Remastered. Moons of Darcelon really reminds me of like a uh, old school Lemmings game. In fact, you play as a little spaceman where you have to save stranded comrades and escort them back to the base using simple commands such as telling them to stay follow go left or go right and they aren't the brightest so if you tell them to go right they may go right off a cliff you can also only issue commands over a set distance and it like pulses out of you like a little circle pulse there are different game elements that are introduced as the game progresses including giving your character a flashlight a laser gun or a jetpack i actually played a little bit of a demo of this game and what i really liked about one of the levels was that you needed to find some crew members who were in the dark and what you would do is you would use your flashlight and you would shine your flashlight on them and then they would see and you could tell them to do something but if you turned your flashlight off they would just stand there and say i can't see anything so you have to like keep constantly like flipping the flashlight back on them so i'm really excited about this game i think it's it's it looks really cool it's got that like 1960s retro futurism vibe to it too which is Uh, I guess apparently going to be very popular, but I'm going to put this down as a good old bio and I'm going to buy it. Nice. Well, Seth, the game that I am looking forward to buy, wait, or passing on is called Agent 64 Spies Never Die. Agent 64 Spies Never Die is being developed and published by Replicant D6, who are an indie developer. It is a retro first person shooter inspired by 90s console shooters specifically those that were created by Free Radical, who are famous for the Time Splitters franchise, and Rare, who made Goldeneye and Perfect Dark. I would say currently, in its alpha build, which it is available as a demo in in a very, very early state, it's definitely taking more from Goldeneye and Perfect Dark at the moment. 
Um, I mean, I definitely can see where time splitters influence can be, but at least in terms of the fact that I think they literally are using sound effects from GoldenEye as placeholder sound effects. Right now, it seems more inspired by GoldenEye and Perfect Dark, but that's fine with me. I love those games. I actually really love both Perfect Dark and GoldenEye, and I really love time splitters. So seeing kind of this new title made in a modern engine that has modern controls for the PC, it just feels really great. I did play the demo. It has a lot of heart to it. You can definitely tell that the people who working on it have a lot of love for that era of gaming. I'm going to keep my eye on it. I'll probably say it's a wait because I have no clue when they're aiming for a release, but I'll certainly kind of check back on the demos that are available as it moves along in progress. Uh, this is one of those games that I'm going to keep an eye on and, uh, We'll see where it goes. And that's going to be our episode. So there's a couple of things that you could do if you got to this part of the episode and you would like more. You could, in fact, listen to us by listening to older episodes, by going back to the back catalog and picking an episode that you may be interested in or listening to them sequentially. And if you want to know where to listen to us, you can use any sort of listening device. Uh, You're listening to us somehow now or else you wouldn't hear my voice. So continue to listen to us the way that you have been listening to us or find us on another podcast app such as spotify stitcher or itunes speaking of itunes if you want to support us you can give us a rating on itunes it really helps with the almighty algorithm and if you continue if you want to continue to support us you can follow us on all sorts of social media we have a facebook an instagram a twitter and a twitch There's a a lot of T's at the end there. Anyway, our Facebook and Instagram are at Classic Gaming Brothers. Our Twitch is twitch.tv slash classic gaming brothers and our twitter is cg brothers pod and we use these various social mediums to play video games very occasionally and also to announce our episodes pretty regularly we also put out other content on them but not very frequently but if you're interested in knowing when our episodes drop which is sunday uh you can follow those and we'll announce we also announce when we drop a non-sunday episodes which we do very occasionally more occasionally than we play video games but less occasionally than we release actual sunday episodes which is every sunday now let's say you listen to this episode and you're like awesome i really love that you guys spent almost an hour of my life talking about encarta and i would like to know more i don't know how much more i can learn about encarta beyond being an encyclopedia so thus the gateway to all knowledge but we, we would we'll work with you and you could tell us that feedback by sending us an email you could send us an email at classicgamingbrothers at gmail.com or Seth at classicgamingbrothers.com Zach at classicgamingbrothers.com or classicgamingbrothers at classicgamingbrothers.com and if that's too much you can always go to our website which is classicgamingbrothers.com and go to our contact us and send a form you can also check out our shop and our uh, special guest section by this time the shop should have been updated so we'll have a new series of shirts in there which are awesome and not at all not appropriate and with that Zach am I missing anything oh yeah don't play games like my brother and don't play games like my brother i've been zach and i've been seth and we've been the classic gaming brothers that's That's right right. that gesture is going to haunt my dreams for the rest of my days he's right behind you Ah!